Okay, Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful day. I mean, what a beautiful day the Lord's given to us. And I'm very thankful. We've been talking about the weather and stuff. I'm thankful for the weather we've had. So thankful. Pray for the folks up in Iowa. Bad, bad news. If you watch some of those hurt, those tornadoes, it was like there were multiple, multiple tornadoes in the big tornado. It was just like, it was just, yeah, it was kind of scary. So definitely pray. Judges chapter 6, Judges chapter 6. We'll start off with verse 1. We're talking talk about a man named Gideon. We're talking about the aspect about faith. We're talking about, we've talked about uh, Abel. We've talked about Enoch. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about a man named uh, Gideon. The scriptures. And the aspect about this is that everyone's different. And yet God chose to be able to recognize them this hall of faith for us to be able to recognize that each of us in our differences, we have many things that's alike when it comes to our Christianity. And it says in verse one of Judges chapter six says this, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord delivered them into the, house, into the hand of Midian seven years. So the nation of Israel, they were blessed, they were doing well. And all of a sudden as that, that pattern goes that once they got, got blessed by God and they become comfortable and they kind of kick back and then God would send a uh, prophet to be able to speak to them and they would refuse to listen to the prophet and God would send judgment upon them and then they couldn't handle the judgment they begged for deliverance and then they were delivered and they would do well they would basically do well become comfortable listen to the prophet reject the prophet Go through judgment. That's the whole aspect about the nation of Israel. And so just like that pattern, that same pattern many times happens in many Christians. And so it says in verse two, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because the Midianites, the children of Israel, made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. By the way, the Midians were relation, the Midianites relations to the Ishmaelites. And Ishmael was whose son? Abraham's son. Abraham could not wait for God to keep the promise. So, he, so his wife gave his, his slave Hagar to have a child. She had a child. And hence, because he did not follow the plan, this result of his action end up following the nation of Israel continually. And so, um, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel and became of the Midianites, the children of Israel, made them the dance. So basically, these Midianites would come and they would plunder the nation of Israel after they would be able to bring up the different uh, grains and vegetables and things. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites, the children of the east, even they came against them. And they camped against them, and then they destroyed the increase of the earth, till so thou come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitudes. So they, they, had, they weren't afraid of the nation of Israel. So it says literally, they would bring what they had to encamp, so they could plunder so there was nothing left from the nation of Israel that they could take back home. For both they and their camels were without number and the entered of the land to destroy it. You know, that's exactly how the world, the flesh, and the, the devil likes to, to Christian. The aspect is that they are, it's a long-term process. Like the Bible says, as a, as a lion seeking whom he, he may devour. A lion has no has no worry about time. When that lion is hungry, he'll find a nice place and and crouch down and then wait for the jut for the right time. That's exactly as believers that this this lion, this Satan, comes out after us and he watches and waits for us 
to drop our guards down and drift away from the pack, and then he catches us, and he catches us, and he and he tries to destroy our lives. And so, but he's not worried about time. He's not worried about time. Because his ultimate goal, if he doesn't have your soul, he's going to destroy your life. And does he do a good job? Yes, he does. And people just give up and quit. And Israel was greatly impoverished because the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. Now notice this. So they, they're plundered. They cry out because they're tired of being in, in, in slavery. So the Lord sends a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God and fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but we have not, but, but you have not obeyed my voice. So God sends the prophet and reminds them what he has done. When we realize how good God has been us, to us in our past, it should be a wake-up call to appreciate what we have in the present. You know, we sing the song, Count Your Many Blessings, and yet it's very easy to forget because it's not being reminded of. There's nothing wrong with it. To, to not go into, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, to go into that land of forgetfulness. Don't ever get to the point that you take for granted how good God is to you right now, how good God has been to you in your past, how good God is going to be to you in your future. As a believer, it's going to be a lot better because we may struggle through this whole world, but we're just passing through. We're heading to a much better place. Every day, heaven sounds that much sweeter. Every day, when I hear about different problems and situations, and, and uh, issues that people are going through, it just makes me realize, thank God, this is not the end of my life. This is only just a passing through time. And so God sends a prophet and said, you better listen, God, look what God has done for you. And the Bible says, "And but, but ye have not obeyed my voice, okay? So they don't listen to, to the voice of the, of the prophet, and there came an angel of the Lord, uh-oh, God's going to send someone else, maybe with a little bit stronger message, and sat under the oak, which is at Ophrah, at pertained unto Joash, the Abiezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So the aspect of uh, the Israelites is that hi they're hiding. They're tired of being plundered. Can you imagine to go through the effort of preparing the ground, to plant the seed, to work the, the, um, the fruits and the vegetables, work all that, and just about the time of harvest, they come in as like grasshoppers go from one end to the other with nothing left. Can you imagine that? And they're tired and they're wore out. And so now they're trying to figure out how can I be able to take care of my family? So they're hiding. They're hiding and they're kind of pigeonholing these different things that this way their houses can be taken care of. And so the first thing the angel of the Lord compliments him by says, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now when you think about a mighty man of valor being one that is a more than conqueror who, who, who is, should be strong and valiant and and being a leader, being out front, encouraging people to keep marching forward. And what was he doing? He was tucked tail and hiding in a cave, afraid of the Midianites. Which tells us that God doesn't look at our present state, he looks at our future state. If we are more than conquerors to him that loved us, if that's the case, that God looks at us in this process of forming us and making us and taking those things out of our lives that shouldn't be there and implementing things that should be in our lives, that this process takes time, that sometimes the process doesn't look very pretty. Sometimes the process is longer than what's expected. 
Sometimes the process is something that, that comes out of the blue. But if we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God ultimately is performing and working us to be a very special vessel of honor. A vessel of honor. So God's looking at Gideon, not at his present state, because if you looked at some guy that has a constant head, head this swivel looking, where's those Midianites at? How am I going to take care of this? How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to make sure that people are taken care of and afraid of the little snap of a twig or, or the, the whisper of the wind thinking, oh, I think I hear an army coming and let me go hide some more. That's not what you think about someone that is a mighty man of valor. So don't, as a believer, you can't look at yourself. I was talking to uh, someone today and they call me up because I really need to talk. And, and they, they were saying, boy, I'm just such a failure in life. I said, wait a minute. And they were telling me some things that I said, stop. God doesn't look at you in your present state. He's looking at you as the, in the finished state. Whether you feel like you're successful or not, it's not even the issue. The issue is, are you willing to God to allow God to keep working on you? Because ultimately, when he looks at you, you're going to be just like Jesus. And God doesn't make junk. Thank God for that. So he, he gives him a compliment. But then also, look at verse 14, and it says this. Oh, let's go to verse, thir verse 12, 13. And Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? This verse was telling me, Pastor, why is it seem like I'm just starting to get back on my feet, keep starting doing what I need to do, and all of a sudden it's come out, I'm just knocked down again. Be careful about asking why. Why is God working this out? We need to understand that by faith, that all things work together for good, all of it. Why? Because in all the processes, God is proving it has control over everything. In the midst of all the chaos of our life, God is working something special. Why then, if the Lord is with us, and where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us? You know, it tells me that his father, maybe his grandfather, shared what it was like to be able to go, go through the Red Sea and to walk down into that wilderness wandering. What it was like to see the, the quail coming in and the manna every day taken care of and how they were blessed to see how God, it says, where's all the blessings that I heard about from my fathers? We're in a generation that doesn't, doesn't realize what God has done in the past. That's why part of let the redeemed of the Lord say so is to share what God has done to share how good God has been to us in our past. This week, I took a group of kids down to a place down there south of Glenda called Five Mile Camp. And on the way back, I was talking to one of the, uh, the teachers there and found he's a foster parent. And we were talking about different things, and he's a Christian. And he said, I just got done having one of my sons just join the military. I said, how'd you do it? He said, I reminded him throughout high school how tough it was, but if that's what your goal is, all these struggles will only make you stronger. He said, then I started telling him about the ways I struggled in high school, the ways I struggled in college, and the ways I struggled as a young married man, and what it took, to all those processes and failures and things, to get to this point right now where I feel like I'm pretty successful. He said that, that uh, he came back from boot camp and said, Dad, thank you for reminding me about it. Tell me about the things because that's what got me through when I wanted to quit. And I wasn't going to quit because my dad went through these different things to get me to this point. And I'm not going to let my dad down. He said, I shared with them, with him and my other foster kids. Said, some, some of them listen, some don't. And that's their choice. He said, but I've always just let them know that I have not always been, it seemed like everything put together because sometimes I've not been put together. It's kind of like a big mess. Kind of like a big old pot of spaghetti. 
I mean, you talk about uh, just a complete jumbled mess. Sometimes that's how life is, isn't it? You can't see all the strands of spaghetti because they're all meshed together. Let alone the sauce that you have on that. Where, if, if everything's okay, where's God at? And why have we not seen all the things I've heard about? Well, in order to get to that point of saying God's blessings, he's having to deal with the nation of Israel's misbehaviors and get to the point to start listening again. Sometimes it takes time to be still and let everything get cleared out so once again we can hear the still small voice of God. Where be all his miracles which your fathers told us of saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us. It's very easy to get depressed, isn't it? Discouraged. Heard so much about how God did the past. Where's he at right now? I need him. I don't need what happened yesterday. I need him today. The Lord has forsaken us. And delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So he forgot where it says that Verse 10, that's part of verse 10, but she have not obeyed my voice. That's why they're in that situation. They did not listen to the voice of God through the prophets and through other ways to get their attention. They just got so caught up with things they forgot. If it wasn't for God, they wouldn't have what they had. And so we see that um, God compliments him. Then he says, God built him up to go in the strength that you have. And it says in verse 14, um, and the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? So not only did he compliment him, but he also built him up. Go in thy strength ye have, and you will deliver Israel. He's complaining about all these different things. God says, guess what? You're the next volunteer. Thank you so much. Well, we know what happens where it says, verse 15. And he said unto him, oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. Boy, I mean, that, that's one of the things that people like to use. Well, you understand what it's like to be poor. Yes, I do. But that's not an excuse not to believe in God. I just don't have everything else that everybody has. It's not fair. Well, life's not fair. Neither are people. But God is consistent. God will always do right, no matter whatever else happens. God will always do right. So it, all of a sudden, God builds them up, and then all of a sudden, they start having, he starts having excuses. Look at Proverbs 22, Proverbs 22. Wrong, wrong the verse. Let's read verse 18 where it says, For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee, they shall withal be fitted in thy lips. But that thy trust may be in the Lord, I'm, I have made known to thee this day, even thee. That's not the verse I was looking for. Let's try Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. You ever heard of a man named Moses? Was see the master of excuses? <laughs> I'm going to have you do this. Verse 10 says this. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, 
and teach thee what thou shalt say. But Lord, you don't understand. I can't speak. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to stutter. God says, um, did you forget I made your mouth? I made your tongue. And I'm going to work that jaw. I'm going to work that tongue. I'm going to allow your mind to connect with your tongue. And you're going to say things that I want you to say. Excuses. Look at Jeremiah chapter one. Jeremiah was a, a prophet. In fact, he was known as the weeping prophet. Why? Because he saw the destruction of, of the nation of Israel. Joshua chapter one, verses six and seven says this. Oh, Jeremiah, I'm sorry. Jeremiah chapter one. We'll go back to verse four, it says this. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. You see, God has a purpose for everybody's life. Even in the womb, God says, I'm, I want you to do this. Can you imagine the, the, the state of our world if there wasn't abortion? Maybe with someone that could have been the one that find that could cure the different types of cancers, or help with make nation, whatever it is. When they killed those babies, they eliminated that child's purpose on the earth as a boy. And we need to pray for our city because they're going to bring one of them places in here. So he says, I have ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, this is Jeremiah, oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a child. But the Lord said unto me, say not I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I am commanded thee, thou shalt speak. He says, don't give me that excuse that you're a child, because you're going you're to speak, you're going to tell, you're going to say the things that I want you to speak. I look at this verse 8. Be not afraid of their faces. Can I tell you that when I first started preaching, we used to go street preaching, and you want to talk about cutting your teeth on people's expressions between dodging the beer bottles and the cussing and stuff like that. Just when you're standing on a street corner and you're just trying to preach a gospel message, I mean, you have people blaring their horns and they're rolling down the windows and they crank up the music. And I mean, you talk about intimidating. Says, don't be afraid of their faces. Why? For I'm with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. He says, don't worry about how they look at you. They're going to stare at you. They're going to growl at you. Don't worry about that because I am with you to deliver thee unto the Lord. Don't worry about them because you're my prophet. You get up, you speak up, and then you shut up. You do what I tell you because I'm with you. And I can tell you, when I stand behind that pulpit, when I am preaching the word of God or I'm teaching the word of God, I can sense the presence of God with me and I can feel like God's speaking. I mean, there's times when I don't like listening to myself preach. I don't. Never have. But I've listened to myself uh, preach. And I'm thinking, when did I say that? I, I, never, I look at, I didn't have that in my notes. Just like that Bible verse, that wasn't in my notes. It's amazing how when you do what God tells you to do, God takes over and you may not even realize he's taken over, but he's working a work and that's why he just wants us to be obedient. That's all. It's not about talent. It's not about ability. It's about willingness to surrender. Lord, may your will be done. Now, look at this. He says, so, don't be afraid because I'm with thee. And the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Can you think of anyone else where God touched another prophet's mouth? Isaiah chapter 6. We took the, the, uh, the coal from off of the tom uh, with the tongs from off the altar and touched his lips. And woe be unto me, for a man of unclean lips. Who's going to go for me? Here am I, send me. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. This, he says, this is why I'm going to give you the words to say. Verse 10. 
See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. I will tell you that as we, as we are doing this service and it's being projected around the world, it is speaking to people's hearts. Devil doesn't like it. That's why he has people to, to try to cause some controversy, Brother Mike, right? Doesn't like it, but that's okay. Because when the word of God goes forth, it will perform the intention that God intends to do, to do. And he says this, he says, to set thee that over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. I'm gonna take what's out there that's being built and I'm gonna tear it all down. I'm gonna break it all the way down the foundations and I'm gonna build exactly what I want to build on that foundation. That's why we do what we're supposed to do. Whether it's the right timing or not, or whether you feel like it or not, or if we don't feel like, look, it's gotta keep doing what you're supposed to do because God has an intention for everything for our lives. So the aspect of all the excuses that, that Gideon used, and then Moses used, and then Peter used, and then all these different prophets and preachers and people that we know of that uh, said, I'm not going to do that. Guess what? They're doing it and God's blessing. Now let's go back to um, uh, Judges chapter 6. I want you to, to do it because you're going to deliver the nation of Israel. Judges chapter 6. Look at verse 17, Judges chapter 6, verse 17. It says, I'm going to be with thee, and so I shall smite the Midianites, so as one man, and he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight. If. Conditional. Are you really sure? He was still not convinced that God wanted to, to, to use him. He was still not convinced that he was worthy enough. Can I say that no one's worthy to do the work of God, but if God called us to do it, then he, he blesses us because with our unworthiness, he is the one that is truly worthy to get all the glory, honor, and praise. It says in verse 16, but, and the Lord said to thee, I'll be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites. It says, if thou art thou grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Here's, here's this, a crisis of his faith. If you really are talking to me, maybe I'm, a, this, I'm not having some kind of a delusion, then show me that this is really happening. Now hold your place here and look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Show me a sign. Look at verses 1 through 4 says this. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. Like the old saying, red, not, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky at morning, sailor take warning. That's an old, old, old cliche. So we're talking about Jesus' turn. I mean, we're talking about 2,000 years ago. So he says, so they're wanting a sign. And Jesus says, okay, you want a sign? Let me teach you something. It's great how the Lord always works out a lesson when the Sadducees, the Pharisees, or every, all the other E's out there that were trying to trip him up. He says, okay, let me give you something exactly what you don't realize what you need, but you're going to need it anyway. First, he says this. In the morning, it will be foul weather today, but the sky is red and loud lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? You can use your knowledge of nature, but you can't see what's right before you, very eyes. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, 
and there shall be no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. What's the what's the aspect of the nation uh, of Jonah? Jonah was sent to go preach to Nineveh. He ran, got swallowed up by a whale. He got regurgitated after three days. And he ran towards him in a three-day journey in one day without taking a shower, without putting on the cologne, and without all that other good stuff. He went as he was. I'm sure he was not the picture of health, let alone, I mean, they said that if, if he would have been in there for three days, he'd have been like a ghost. All that acid would have just whitened his skin. Can you imagine? I mean, you're walking around, doing, and all of a sudden some wacko guy comes in and says, you better repent, God is coming. I mean, it was so scary. Even the leadership of the town got right with God. I would too. Just to think of, here's a ghost here, and I'm missing a ghost. I better make sure I'm, I'm, things are all right to me and God. <laughs> but that was a sign. The sign of Jonas is that there's wickedness out there. And God is going to send someone to preach against the wicked. Boy, when you think about our country, you see all the wickedness around our country. And it's just not in big, it used to be the big cities. The little cities were kind of just left alone. But now it doesn't matter what sign, how big the city is, the aspect of sin has just not crept in, but it's been a tidal wave even in our little cities. The sign of Jonas. They need to hear about the Lord. And Jesus saying, hey, you want a sign? Remember what happened to, with Jonah. He said, I need a sign. So his first confirmation is, you got to show me a sign. Then the next happens, look at verse 19, says this. He performs a sacrifice. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and 11 cakes of an ephah of flour, the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him upon the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth, and he did so. So we're talking about a fire. Pour all this stuff out on the fire. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the lemon cakes and lay them on the rock. Verse 21, the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. He performs a sacrifice and all of a sudden <coughs> an angel's here and gone. Would that not be a sign to say, maybe I better listen? Because that just doesn't happen every day. Put yourself in, in Gideon's shoes. What would you do? Would you say, huh, I better listen to, the, to, to this person who just came to me because this guy's, wow, pretty powerful. So the, he performs a sacrifice and this angel of the Lord disappears in the sacrifice, it says in verse 23, and the Lord said unto him, peace be unto thee. Who else spoke peace be unto thee? Jesus. Many theologians believe that this is what they call a Christophany, which, which was an Old Testament visitation of Jesus. Gideon. Because he said, peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not did not Jesus say that after he resurrected from the grave? It's going to be okay. I've handled it. So we see that it was complimented. God built him up. We see that his first confirmation says, I gotta, I've got to figure out something. Show me, if it really happens, show me a sign. And I'll be honest with you, there's been some times where I've had said, okay, God, if you really want me to do this, you're going to have to open up the door and Lord, sometimes I'm, I'm a little stubborn. I may not see like I should, but let me see that door being open. If you don't want it, then close the door. 
That has been my prayer since 1989. Lord, either open up the door so wide that no one can shut it, or Lord, seal that door so tight that no one can jam it open. May your will be done. And the aspect about that is that trust and timing. Everything about the Lord is trust and timing. And I've got, I can tell all kinds of stories about that, but I won't for the sake of time. <clears throat> we see in verse 25, his first job after he sees the angel or, or, or the Christophany of Jesus. Verse 25 says this. So he builds an altar, verse 24. Then Gideon built an altar, they went to the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom, God our peace. Now what's the significance of this phrase of Jehovah Shalom? Why would he establish this first saying about God being our peace at this particular time? Because they were, they were being chased down, they were losing everything. They're afraid that the Gideonites were going to Midianites were going to come in. They were afraid that they were going to lose all their food again. They're afraid that their family and, and, and they're going to be destroyed. So Jesus says, peace be still. And so the establishment of God, our peace, comes in the midst of trials and tribulations. This thing I told on the, on the way back to the church about 9-11. And I can remember that time. Well, you talk about just like a just a gut punch. And I remember we were just outside of Manassas, Virginia, and, and those, I remember when they had all the planes just shut down. And I'll, I'll never forget, that was on a Tuesday, and on a Saturday, that these planes are still not up in the air, and then all of a sudden, I'm out visiting, and all of a sudden, I hear something hear the whine of a small plane. My first response was, I'm going to go hide because what's happening next? The whole nation was crippled with fear. What's going to happen next? I mean, there are people out in the yards. Or, I mean, you're talking about a ghost town just by hearing the little, the little prop plane. They were afraid. In the midst of all the turmoil, in the midst of all the unknown, God says, I want you to have peace. And I want this to be established that when you feel like you're completely being attacked, I'm going to be your peace. Because true peace comes from the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace, the royalty of peace is Jesus Christ. When we look at Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day, it is yet an Ophrah of the Abbey is right. And so the next thing that happens after he gets peace, now I got a job for you to do. When God has us prepared, then he says, get busy. He never just lets us linger, strike out the iron hot, iron's hot. That was a phrase I heard many times. And I'm just going to read this and we'll stop. We'll stop right here. Verse 25 says this. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. God says, okay, I've given you peace. I've given you assurance I'm going to take care of you. Now let's put this to the test. I want you to go to your father's altar that he's sacrificing to the false gods, I want you to destroy it. How would I feel like, uh, uh, can I find someone else to be a replacement to this? I don't want to touch that stuff. I mean, there's one thing I knew as a kid, you never you never touch dad or mom's stuff, or else you may come back with the stuff. You just don't do that. But God says, I want you the big test. Because you can't handle the Midianites, you can't handle the fear of your father. Because your father's not doing the right thing. And his father was a Jew who had chosen to sacrifice the false god of Baal. All right, let's start cleaning house.
And I'll stop right here with that. But the challenge to get rid of the altar to a foreign God. Well, I mean, when you start reading it and you start analyzing it, this man's this man named Gideon had a pretty complex life. We'll see that later on as we go through this thing next week about how God worked to be able to take care of the Midianites. You're not going to be able to go take your, take your few hundred to fight against the big army if you can't handle the fear of your dad. It's just God stair steps us up. And he gives us peace in the battle. What a great God we serve. Okay, let's take a